Medical Research. We'd like to welcome each and every one of you here to this exhibition opening, featuring the work of our artist in residence, Barb Matz. In a few moments, I'll invite Barb up to talk a little bit more about her exhibit in detail. But for now, I'd like to share with you a little bit about Barb. Barb received her bachelor's degrees in education and special education from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. She later returned to her studies and completed a degree in visual art from the University of Wisconsin-River Falls. And then she received her Master of Arts in Education from St. Mary's University in Winona. You may have already noted from the description of Barb's educational background that she is both an artist and a teacher. Barb retired at the end of last academic year from Hastings Middle School after 30 years of teaching. Throughout her career, she designed and implemented both special education and visual arts curriculum for over 5,000 elementary and middle school students. That's a lot of kids. <laughs> Barb has participated in a number of jury gallery shows throughout Minnesota and beyond. She is the owner of Right Brain Ventures Art in Northfield, Minnesota, which is a freelance business that produces and sells original work. Barb will be on campus through the end of, the, of this semester, and she is joined by her husband, Steve McKelvey, who is also a resident scholar, scholar in our um, scholars program. So please join me in welcoming Barb Nance. Thank you. Um, I hope it's okay if I'm sitting. Uh, that's I like to be eye to eye with people, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin by extending a great thank you to the Collegeville Institute for having me here and sponsoring this exhibit and allowing this to occur. Um, when I first learned of the opportunity to paint unimpeded and be supported in such a beautiful setting, I quite frankly couldn't believe it. <laughs> to have access to a group of intelligent and discerning peers um, and a chance to discuss my work as well as other issues for more than a weekend seemed like a dream. <laughs> Yet, here we are. As I Facebooked my friends about this opportunity, one answered, you're making this up, right? <laughs> <laughs> I also want to thank the other scholars for their time and patience in listening to my stories and for coming this afternoon. And I also want to thank Kyle and the maintenance department for their help <laughs> hanging those paintings. It, it seems minor maybe, but for an artist that's huge. It's just huge because you're trying to get them centered and even and I can't measure and they can and it was great. So. Um, the process for production of this series has been long in coming. I have just completed a 30-year teaching career, having instructed over 10,000 students from kindergarten through eighth grade in visual art. As my colleague Jeannie knows, <laughs> she, she was my best buddy when we were teaching, so I'm um, glad to have her here too. Um, during the last 10 years, the idea for this series on the Deep South has been ever present in my mind, resulting in the collection of hundreds of photos notes to myself, ticket stubs, menus, and other memorabilia from trips south. It really took an enormous amount of energy, subconsciously mostly, to hold these ideas in my mind as I went about teaching middle school students full time. I can say that some of the inspiration for this series started back in 1990 when I lived in Raleigh, North Carolina for a year. Because travel is a big part of my life, I have spent quite a bit of time exploring the culture and history of the Deep South. This is the topic of the series on which I'm working here. I find the South an enigma. It is a beautiful place full of rich culture, yet what occurred there is horrific. This paradox fascinates me. How could such a land of plenty be so cruel? 
We can easily say that the horrors of slavery occurred so long ago that we should be moving on. As a northerner in the 21st century, I might say that I personally had nothing to do with what went on there. Yet, the white race has benefited from that system. This raises questions to consider. What is my responsibility from 2013 on to people who were hurt by this system? As I continued to pursue this series, it occurred to me that a twin series could accompany it, the Deep North, because while the South certainly is guilty of the sins of outright slavery, it seems to me that dealing with racism in the North is more slippery. What are the subtleties that exist here? What lies beneath Minnesota nice? How does the racist system manifest itself, and how do we begin breaking this cycle? The series is compri comprised of nine paintings so far. I say so far because there may be more added as I continue my travels. Since art is a language of symbols, each painting tells a different story. And while I had a certain story in mind, perhaps the paintings will inspire your own stories. Some of the questions that were in my mind as I worked were, what contributions can I make to ease this pain? What feelings of guilt are unhealthy and should be let go while still acting with compassion and responsibility? And more broadly, what should be happening on a national level to rectify what happened? How do we communicate about this? <coughs> it is my hope that viewing this series will help the viewer to ask his or her own questions about our national history. It seems that we have had 300 years of an unhealthy cycle of human relations between races and that this occurs worldwide. I seriously keep asking myself, what is our problem? Are humans captive to a reptilian brain? Must we act like automatons? Are we so deeply programmed? Where is our higher level thinking? How do we access <coughs> our cerebellums rather than our brain stems? Yet, we can also see how very slowly through time, good and new creations arise from this conundrum. One can see it in parts of Southern culture. The blues certainly arose from trials of oppression. Musicians led the way for heartfelt communication. For instance, the Marquis were one of the first integrated groups playing blues and early rock in Memphis. When they went live, audiences were stunned to see the stage curtains open to a black and white band. Now the blues is a widely respected musical genre. And people all over the U.S. enjoy Cajun food, which was hardly known beyond New Orleans 40 years ago. And who doesn't like barbecue? This treat is enjoyed much more frequently now through venues like Famous Dave's, which, which comes with food and cultural memorabilia all in one. The space in which these paintings are displayed requires the viewer to stand fairly closely, close to the paintings. Many of them do have small detail that is best viewed close up. However, I do recommend that you step back farther as well and compare the views. What if anything changes as you change your vantage point? At times, I felt overwhelmed, wondering, how can I begin to encapsulate my feelings on the Deep South, races, black and white? How can I dare to even show this, me with my white Anglo-Saxon upper Midwest upbringing, hardly ever having talked to a black person in depth? Is what I'm saying even authentic? What do I know about it? And then it occurs to me, all I can do, really, is show my own perceptions, my own thoughts, what I've observed. We all can only show our own truth at any given time. Maybe this will be enough, maybe it won't. I guess that's part of taking a risk. And if it comes off as unreal, pearly, fake, or stereotypical, I guess that's what I know right now. But it's not fake or pearly to me. It seems to me we've got to start somewhere. And this is my somewhere. I'm showing it to you. Please enjoy the exhibit.